You know, we're doing a series called The Great Harvest. Say The Great Harvest. The great Harvest. And it's great for two reasons. <clears throat> Number one, it's great because of the, 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 the multitudes, the myriad of people of what that is referencing to. But also, it's a reference to the great things that God brings up out, out of the harvest field. God can take an, ex, an ordinary individual and make something great out of their life in Christ Jesus for his purposes. And I want everyone in this room to be hopeful, to be expectant of the great things that God has before you. And no matter where you've been, how it's been, or what's been, forgetting those things which are behind us, we move forward to those things which are before us. I love the backstory of this song because it's gonna parallel what seems to be on my heart. And I really have to give credit to, to my granddaughter, Isabella Sepulveda, who's right now with uh, Tally and Alexis. They were, they were at a leader's encounter in Mexico City. Talk about having to travel for an encounter. But, um, but they also sent me, she got to do a little worship there. <laughs> it's funny, you know, seeing her sing in, in English to Spanish-speaking people. It's just amazing. <laughs> I, I trust they understood what she was saying. Anyways, uh, but um, it's amazing and um, it's powerful. And um, what I saw yesterday, I want to say thank you to Pastor Kuna and all the G12 leaders because the impact that took place in the hearts because hearts were yielded and prepared to pour out. And um, just powerful. I, I'm, just, I'm just mesmerized by the goodness of God. But everybody has a story, don't we, in one sense or another. And many of you came in with a story. And I believe God knows exactly who we are. In every service, I always know that. No matter, the message might be shaped the same, but he knows who you are. And he, he alone can give you ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart to receive because if you receive, there is healing for us. And I pronounce and declare that there will be healing today. But this story, as I've said before, and I only repeat because there are people that might be listening to me online, not only from this island, from the outer islands that have not heard, but also people from outside the islands. There are thousands of people that have devices that watch on a Sunday morning. And you never know who they are. And they're as important as any person here. And because God knows that he needs, they need to hear what he wants to say. He will even use lips of clay to do it. But that story is a raw story, very relatable, not just musically, lyrically. The lyrics are prolific, powerful, no question about that. Simple, but then somehow it reaches us, doesn't it? Because it's, it's not only relatable, it's identifiable. It speaks of a part in our life, our weaknesses to some degree, or... But it's a, a voice that's crying out. And we love the vulnerability and the sound of when a person shares their story. Maybe it's a testimony. Maybe it's in a song. Maybe it's a poem. Maybe it's something. And when they open up somehow and begin to flow and they have a fluidity about themselves where they begin to expose, not in a, in a wrong way, but just open up, it just becomes very riveting. And that song does that, at least does for me. Because they're lyrics from a soul. Um, he speaks a lot about, for example, who will be water to my right. The word water is a reference to a refreshing or a quenching or um, like a river in the desert, like Pastor Coley and Branson taught not too long ago. And it's important that you understand me riot. Me riot is just an interesting way of saying my riot, riot, chaos, my confusion or what I see is confusing. And so he's asking for answers. And in fact, twice, if not three times, he says, who's going to save the day? He makes a reference to God. He's asking God to step in, somebody to step in. And actually, it's a soul that's searching for answers. That's why it becomes relatable. That's what becomes identifiable, not just musically. But... It's a song that is 
composed, authored, and sung from what Jesus referred to as the harvest field. Let me explain that to you. In fact, I'd go one step further and say the author, Labyrinth, songwriter, is the harvest field. It's not a place, it's a person. And so harvest, the word harvest in itself, simply means ready for reaping. Jesus was not referring to agricultural crops like wheat or corn, but wheat is often used as a symbol because in the Hebrew language, wheat is often a metaphor for people. Just thought I'd throw that in there. But he's not talking about agricultural crops. Like I said, he's talking about hearts, lives, people, humanity, and, uh, and the condition of their hearts and how they're ready for his unconditional love, for his salvation. And so let me speak to you about something that uh, hold on to your seats. It's going to be good. I'm just trying to know how I'm going to get there. But it's... So what we need to understand is that the harvest field is a people that are living currently a Christless, in a Christless eternity. I didn't say they didn't go to church. I didn't say they didn't think they were spiritual. I didn't say they didn't think they were religious. A Christless eternity is simply a person alive on this side of heaven, on earth, that has not yet been born again. Everybody alive on this earth will live for eternity. Jesus came, though, to give eternal life so that people which God did not choose, would end up in eternal hell. So that's what I mean by crisis eternity. But last week we brought something out that the harvest field has to be understood. It's under an influence. Let me paint the picture. An influence that those that are living a Christless life are not yet born again. That's all I mean by that. Don't even know they're being influenced. Like, that was my life. I, for 25 years, I, would, I went to church, but I was never born again. And though my mother took me there, me and my sister, we went, it had no relevance to my life at all. I never was born again. If I knew symbols, I knew saints, and I knew images, I knew buildings. Yeah, sure. I learned a few words, but it doesn't mean I was born again. And sometimes we use that word, why well, I go to church? Yeah, but are you born again? But I go to church. Yeah, but are you born again? Hey, I'm spiritual, right? Okay, we all that's that. But you know, so what I want you to understand, the influence I'm talking about is an anti-Christ spirit. Everyone in the harvest fields is the field you and I, if you've been born again, came out of. It's completely anti-Christ, completely opposite of God. No matter how contemporary, how hip, how happening, how relevant you think it is to your life. Let me, let me give you some understanding. I remember when I, when I was going to USC and my, my now wife, of course you know, Pastor Kuna, she first got born again by her brother over the phone as he was calling her and why we were both like living crazy. Some of you are thinking like, how crazy, tell us. No. <laughs> okay. You guys are so niele. Wow. <clears throat> Anyways. And so, um, and I remember she was then trying to share with me how much Christ loved me, and I couldn't even comprehend that word. Um, didn't understand love on that level. Uh, this and the other. And I was so resistant, and I was so 
mean and angry and upset and full of strife. I would hang the phone, throw the phone, I'd shout at her. Really, I really get loud. So how dare you? I mean, I was, and I, I didn't even know why I was manifesting. I mean, I didn't know, except I was offended. I was offended, you would tell me. I'd go to church. What I was trying to say, and then say, I go to church, it did me no good. So I didn't understand. I didn't know that I was under the influence of an antichrist spirit. Ephesians chapter 2, we read last week. Don't have time to go over there. But everyone that is not born again, you might think you're not, you are under an influence. Because you're either two kinds of people, you are either born again or you're not in God's eyes. Now, let me give that a little bit more clarity because some of you are on the tipping point of getting offended right there. Being under an antichrist influence, I'm not saying that God is condemning. He's just clarifying what you do not see with your natural eyes. The whole world is not natural. The whole world is under an influence, either Christ or the Antichrist. The Antichrist will do everything, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, to blind those lest they believe and come to the glory of salvation. And I'm talking about the devil and his cohorts. But in that harvest field might even be what I call, you know, religious people. People that say, hey, I go to church. Spiritual people, whatever it is that they believe that they call themselves spiritual, in their opinion. Um, good people. Um, in character, I speak. Humanitarians, philanthropists, scientists, brilliant geniuses that have helped medical doctors of every sort that, that have saved lives, that have done incredible things, people of achievement, people of advancement, people of money, people of power, People that are icons in your eyes on a daily basis from Hollywood to music who's, you know, you know, were mesmerized. Every level of every dimension of life. Still, though a harvest field could be all of that, all of that, and still be headed for a Christless eternity. Because you're not saved by your works, your talents, your gifts, your pedigree. You're saved by grace through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Well, I only bring that to your attention. That the whole world is under the, not just the harvest field, even the church today. If, if we're not aware of, last week I shared that Evangelist Norval Hayes once said, he said, the most important thing in, in life is Jesus. The second most important thing is understanding your enemy. And this is where we don't understand generation. Seducing spirit, deceptive spirits, things that come in and capture us when we have a legal right to be free. The enemy does not have power over the church. When I say the church, I don't mean a building, I mean you. If you're truly born again, you have authority over the adversary. But if you don't use it, you can be imprisoned. And uh, so this is what Jesus said. Jesus said to his own disciples, why should you say the harvest field is another four months away? Look at the people coming. Now is harvest time. Say that. Now is harvest time. Say it a little louder. Now is harvest time. Their hearts are like vast fields, ripened, grain ready for a harvest. Everyone who reaps these souls for eternal life will receive a reward. Both those who plant spiritual seeds and those who reap the spiritual harvest will celebrate together with great joy. Verse 37 says, and this confirms the same. One sows the seed and another reaps the harvest. I have sent you out to harvest a field. I have sent you out to harvest a field. 
that you haven't planted, where many others have labored long and hard before you. And now you are privileged to profit from their labors and reap the harvest. Everyone say, I have been sent, assigned, authorized, and deputized in the name of Jesus to go out to harvest a field, to reap the harvest. It's important that you and I know that this is so true right now. I want to share something to bring this. If you don't understand that you live in a spiritual world and all you do is buy into everything being natural, this is where we get tricked. That song that was just sung reminds me of a person in the Bible that Jesus spoke about that had a similar song guaranteed different musicality, but a lot of the same words. Different story at a different time, I would even say 2,000 years plus before Lambeth even wrote his song that you just heard a moment ago. But very similar. And that's why it's, Jesus mentions it. His name is Levi. Let me explain this to you. And let me share with you something that's really important that's going to help us all this morning. Luke 5 says, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi. Say Levi. Levi. Living at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, left everything, and followed him as his disciple. Now, did Levi leave everything? Well, it says here, he got up and left everything. Well, he left everything physically that he knew to leave. But did he leave everything? No. He carried some bags, just like some of you came in here with bags. It's called soul bags. Let me explain that to you. He only left what he could see. He got up from being the tax collector that he chose to be, and I'll get to that in a second. I'll explain all of this to you, so follow me. And he did follow Jesus. That was the open door to what was about to happen in his life. Many of you know this, many of you don't. Let me tell you right now. Levi later became Matthew. Matthew means gift of God. But when Matthew tells his story, he never refers to himself as Levi because he, that was a dark place in his life. Mark refers to him and Luke referred to Matthew, not as Matthew, but as Levi. That being said, Levi was actually carrying a lot of baggage. Like every one of the disciples that Jesus asked to come and follow him and be his disciple. When Jesus asks you to be his disciple, to follow him, to be born again, the story ain't over. The adventure has begun. The greatest time of your life, the most powerful time ever, but without that first step, you never get to the second. Let me, let me open this up a little bit more. You see, Levi was actually carrying what I call soul baggage. What I mean by that is, is he was carrying offenses, hurts and pain, negative thoughts, perspectives, bitterness towards people, towards even God to some degree, uh, bad habits, twisted character issues, maybe hatred, wrong beliefs. The list goes on and on and on and on. Let me share with you the world that, as it continues on in Scripture, that Levi was coming out of whom you now read as Matthew. We continue on in verse 29. 
Later, Levi, right, held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. And many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples, why do you eat and drink with the scum? Now, this gives you a little, we're talking about the parasites of life in their eyes. Hmm? Listen, Jesus responds and says, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call those, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but to those who know they are sinners and need to repent. This tells a lot. You wouldn't understand, well, you would. Levi was a hurting person. He was hurting and he was bitter. Levi knew that his spiritual condition, you see, he was a Jewish man who was a betrayer to his own nation. He was a sellout. He was a traitor. And he did it for money. He did it for the money that he could get as a tax collector, which meant that to have that level of money, he'd have to turn against his own people and work with the oppressors of Israel, which is why he was a scorned person, hated by his own people, seen as a betrayer and a sellout, which he could have at any time chosen to say, oh, you know what, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, I repent. I'm... No, he didn't though. He held on to the job because the money became very powerful. The position and influence became very powerful. You see, he had made it to the top of his game. He had money, he had position, he had influence, he had power. He was known throughout the city, much like Lambeth. He said... When the lights and cameras fade, all that's left, no saints, he says. Empty hearts, empty heads, lonely, hurting, and crying. Will somebody save the day? To some degree, as simple as it might be, notice that Jesus did not condemn him, did not judge him, scold him, scorn him because he couldn't bring healing to him until he took his first step. Jesus looked down the corridor of his eyes. He probably heard of who the Messiah was, but maybe because of who he was, he couldn't even go out into the community or he would have been stoned and mocked and scorned by others who hated tax collectors, especially a Jewish man who turned his back on his own people. Never been there? Don't raise your hands. He knew that he couldn't continue to live this way, but he didn't know how to rescue. And he knew he couldn't save himself, rescue himself. Then when Jesus looked down, what did he notice that Jesus looked at him with eyes of love, eyes of compassion, eyes of mercy. He gave him an invitation that says, follow me. I want to be your friend. Follow me and let me disciple you. Let, the disciple is the teacher. Let me teach you instead of you teaching you. Because you teaching you, you might have money, you might have position, but you're all broken up on the inside. You're a sad man, miserable, offended, hurting, and you're angry all the time. So he invites them to a party, a pachanga, a fiesta. Woohoo! With everything going on. And the only people that were there were the scum, people like him, the low life of life. That technically everyone knew that man, this is where prostitutes hang out and 
you know, bad people that you don't want to associate that will never help you to climb the social ladder of life. But Jesus said, I didn't come for those who think they have arrived. You Pharisees, I speak of. In a different place, he says, no, you're nothing more than whitewashed sepulchers full of dead man's bones. You're nothing but players. You have your phylacteries. You have your dress. You have your titles. You have your positions. And you think you're righteous. And you are so lost. But I come for the sick, the ill. And at least, I'm sure, you know, Levi's saying, well, I guess he's talking about us, guys. <laughs> you know? But it was okay. Because the, Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save the world. But he doesn't mean that he doesn't want you to unpack your bags. We're going to unpack some bags today. Mm. So as I said, the transformation happened. Not because Levi was perfect. But because Levi knew he needed rescue. Somehow, he was willing to drop the pride that had got him to that position. So Matthew was Levi before Levi became Matthew. And so what I want to share with you is, yes, Jesus saw this. And I say to you before I move on that everyone in this room, you are one decision away from a totally different life. And here he has been given an opportunity. And opportunities are so important and I know God is opening up your heart, your ears, your eyes in ways because healing will come by what you see, what you hear. The opportunity, Leonard Revenhill once said, of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. Here, a broken, hurting man who chose his direction but realized, <laughs> man, this money ain't worth it. It just isn't worth it. I can't live any longer this way. And Jesus came to him as Jesus comes to you. And Levi was sitting in his collector's booth, sitting in the harvest field, because Levi, as Labrath, is the harvest field. Levi was bad on the inside. I don't mean that he was wicked. I mean he was just hurting and broken. And again, I, I move on. One day, Jesus just simply said one thing to him. As he says to you today, follow me and be my disciple. Hmm. Some of you think, I've done that. We'll see. No, 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 Pastor Art, I've done that. That's why I'm here. Yeah. You're in a good place. Thank you for coming. Without any question, God loves us absolutely and unconditionally when he finds us. Whether we're drowning in the miry clay, when we're lost as a blind goose in a snowstorm. But he loves us too much to leave us there. And the first thing he must do to bring to you everything he made available to you is for you to make that first decision. Follow me and be my disciple. Follow me and let me teach you because you don't know where you're going. He's trying to get anyone and everyone that's in the harvest field out, of, but he's doing it with love. He's doing it with compassion, no condemnation, no shame, no accusation. He's not putting anyone down. He's not oppressing anybody. He's not dominating, manipulating. No, he has to get you to make that decision. You are the only one who can make that decision. That being said, it's important. That's when your walk of faith, trusting God with all of your heart begins. And then he begins to ask you to unpack your soul baggage. Because the moment you're born again, the Holy Spirit moves in. 
See, most of us do not understand. This will help you understand Christianity. Most of you don't understand that you are thoroughly conditioned. You call it education. No, you are conditioned by an antichrist spirit. <gasps> How dare you? I'm saved. I don't know who I am. Jesus is Lord. I didn't say you weren't saved. I said your mind is conditioned. Some of you have, and you know you have, opinions on lifestyle, on perspectives of life. That the moment someone shares something with you from the Bible, you get borderline offended. Well, I believe my body, my choice. No. That, that opinion came from somebody who has an antichrist spirit about him. Oh, how could you say that? It's easy. I just said it. I'm not judging anybody. But because you don't know what it is, hold on to your seat. Very easy to get upset before you hear everything that needs to be said. See, you can be saved and never get whole and healed, though you have every right through the cross of Calvary, through the blood of Jesus, through the word of God, to be whole and healed. You have to unpack the soul. Well, the soul, you're a three-part person, spirit, soul, and body. This body is simply your earth suit. Your spirit is what's saved. Your soul is what's damaged often. We don't have a prosperous soul. You have a right to one. Soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. When you have a mindset that's prejudicial, when you have a mindset that's unforgiving, when you have hurts that you feel cannot be healed, when you carry bitterness and anger and offense and unforgiveness, jealousies, and the list goes on and on and on. That's the soul baggage that the Holy Spirit is going to help you unpack. Let me introduce to you the strength of your life. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. What's, your, what's a culture? A culture is a, a way of believing, a way of thinking, a way of seeing, a way of speaking, opinions, mindsets. Because you're born again or because you go to church, it doesn't mean that you're still not conditioned. That's why you have to renew your mind. Okay, let me help you. Look what it says. Some of us don't even know. We get secondhand offenses. Uh -uh. Oh, I'm going to help you. Wow, this is, I'm going somewhere. Instead, fix your attention on God and you'll be changed from the inside out. When you're in Christ, you no longer live from the outside in, from the outside world in. You live from the inside out. You live by the power of your spirit, your heart, being born again. There is power, and I'm going to show you exactly where you are right now. So powerful for your life. What I'm about to share with you will affect everything in your life. Everything you will ever come across as a born-again believer. What I'm about to share with you is how you will live the rest of your life. From the inside out. That is a process that never ends. You learn about it, but you grow in it every day. Just like you are to grow in your marriage. Grow in your relationships. Grow in your career. Grow in your spiritual walk with God. Why do people stagnate and end up in a rut? Because they stop growing. Say, not in this house. The Christian's new way of living is not by what you see and by your senses. It's living from the inside out. Listen to what, same verse, different um, translation. Stop imitating the ideals and the opinions of a culture around you but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit. 
through a total reformation, in other words, new way of thinking, of how to think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Notice what it says, be transformed by the Holy Spirit. If you are born again, I mean, even if you just got born again 30 seconds ago, instantly the Holy Spirit has made his home in you. The most powerful life you will ever live is understanding who the Holy Spirit is for everything. It will shape you, he, sorry, will shape you to be the father you never thought you could be, the husband you never thought you could be, the man you never thought you could be, the woman you never thought you could be, the mother you never thought you could be, the wife you never thought you could be, the parent you never thought you could be, the child you never, you never, you can never live the kind of life that you can only live, only live by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is not a thing He's not somebody in the dugout waiting for someone to call him up to pinch hit in a tight spot. He is watching over the church. He is living inside of you. He is the one who is sent by the Father and the Son. It was what Jesus did so the Holy Spirit could be sent so that you would have order in your life, power in your life, rescue in your life supernatural ability beyond your ability in your life made available by the mercy of God the grace of God the goodness of God the salvation of Jesus Christ you have resurrection power but he is the one who shows up and does the miraculous he is the one who wants to show up and he's saying you got to start including me because you cannot be the kind of marriage you need to be without me. You cannot be the kind of parent you need to be without me. You cannot be the kind of leader you need to be in your generation without me. There's nothing you can do. When you idolize your information called education and give them and make them an idol as if they got you there, who gave you the brains? And you glorify flesh and blood that are Christless. I didn't say you don't need information, but what you need more is a revelation of who's dwelling on the inside of you. Let me help you a little bit more. Very practical here. Very practical. And I'm going to help you. You're going to see something that some of you have never seen, and we're going to unpack this thing, but you have to understand, even as a believer, even as a Christian, you need to understand, first of all, make it simple. Yes, you're in Christ. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. That's why you can say, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Okay? But you still don't know everything. You don't know everything. You never will know everything. What you need to know about your marriage is what you don't know, what you need to change until he helps you. Don't ever justify your father's, your mother's past habits and nullify the authority of God's work and word in your life. So, New Testament reveals to us how we should live. I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart, into man or woman, of course, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. He's not talking to the unchurched. He's talking to the church. He's talking to you. Say, he's talking to me. Talk to say, he's talking to me. Talk to your neighbor, say, he's talking to you. Talk to you. It would say, he's talking to us. Talk to us. Out loud, say, he's talking to the, church. Talk to the church. That's right. And he is. But God has revealed them to us through his Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. But what man knows the things of man except the spirit of man, that's that part of you, that's your heart. Spirit of man is how you live from the inside out. Your spirit, which was once dead in sins and trespasses, is now alive. You are born again. Hmm? Watch. Which is in him. Where is he? In me. Say, in me. Where is he? In me. Even so, no one, sorry, even so, sorry, 
Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world. See, when you were in the harvest fields, you were being spiritually influenced. It's called the prince of the power of the air. We, we don't have a demon spirit. We don't have a foreign spirit. We don't have a wicked spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. This is what it says right here. He's just clarifying everything. You, you, this, is how, this is how you were created. Okay? And now you have, now we have not received, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the Holy Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words of man's wisdom, that man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The Holy Spirit is 1,000% vital to every realm of your life, not just to Sunday morning church. He is to lead your life. He was sent by the Father and the Son. Did you know that Jesus right now, you know where he is? The Bible tells you he's at the right hand of the Father making intercession for you. <laughs> you mean he's not here? He is through another comforter called the Holy Spirit. Let me help you. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons or daughters of God. Verse 16 actually goes on to say, I forgot to separate them. For the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. Bearing witness means the Holy Spirit prompts you, speaks to you, nudges you. He's alive. He's not a thing. He's not an it. He's a person. Watch. It's important for you and I to understand. Here we go. If the Holy Spirit, if, in other words, if you're born again, if the Holy Spirit is the source of our life, we must also allow the Holy Spirit to direct every aspect of our lives. That means my monies. I speak to the non-tithers. <laughs> Acts of kindness. I speak to families and relationships. There are things that the church does because the world does it. Because you're conditioned. And you're wondering, I'm going to show you why you're so frustrated. You'd rather point your finger at me and call me narrow-minded, small-minded. You're just religious. You're just trying to take my fun. I'm not taking anything. You already took it. Let me help you. This will help you. There is no way if you're born again that you do not have the Holy Spirit. Whether you choose to listen to him is a completely different matter. Well, how can he live in me and me? Because it's your choice. See, most people say, what are we, what are we here today? You know, we just got to be, you know, we got to just, you know, there are different lifestyles. There's the alphabet soup people, and then there's trans, and it's my body, my choice. If you're a Christian, that is carnality. Let me help you. Let me help you. You are simply conditioned by your flesh and not by the Holy Spirit. Let me help you. Let me help you. Oh, I know I'm on the borderline right now. I can sense it. But I'm not dealing with flesh and blood. I'm dealing with a spirit here. Let me help you. Let me help you. Let me help you. Listen, listen. This is not in any way, in any way, condemnation. In any way is it shame. In any way. What I'm dealing with is you don't even know why you think the way you think. Because though you've come out of the world, sometimes the world hasn't yet fully come out of us. Remember when Egypt was delivered by the 10 miracles and signs of spitting of the Red Sea, they still wanted to go back to Egypt. They still opposed Moses. They still opposed God. 
They still oppose him. That's what kept them in the wilderness. But we're not in the Old Testament anymore. We're in the New Testament. Okay, here we go. So Paul the Apostle, New Testament, speaking to the Corinthian church, says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Where is he? Where is he? Say in me. Where is he? Again? Again? Tell your neighbor, he's in you. Everyone say, he's in the church. He's in us. He's in me. Again, your neighbor, he's in you. <clears throat> Whom you have from God, and you are not your own. You were bought with a price. The politicians didn't go to the cross of Calvary for you who made all those laws. The doctor who wants to cut up your body as a trans, you know, to make money on your flesh did not go to Calvary for you. The people that are trying to force you to act on all the pronouns did not go to the cross of Calvary to redeem and restore your life. Do you understand what I'm talking about here? You need to understand that this is talking about you are no longer your own. There is one person who paid a price for you. One person who poured out his blood for you. One person that faced every, every demon of the darkness and Satan himself and defeated him three days and three nights in the valley of the earth but rose up again victorious having in his hand the victory keys over death, hell, and the grave for your good, for your benefit, so you can make a choice and say, I'm free, I'm free, I'm free. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And nobody paid that price for you. Nobody but the Son of God. Nobody but the blood of the Lamb. There's nobody who paid that price for you. That's why he says to you, young girl. Listen to me, that's why he says to you, young guy, young lady, you can be seated. That's why he says to you right now, for you were bought with a price. Because you don't know the price that was paid for you, you have no reverence or fear for God. And that is the deception. The enemy has no power over the church. But he uses deception. He uses dis, dis, oh, seducing spirits. So let me finish. It says, you were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That's why God says, it's not your body to fornicate. It's not your body to adulterate. It's not your body to do the things that you're doing, to watch the things that you're watching. It's not your body. It's not a matter of law and legalism. That's what the Antichrist wants to tell you. They're going to take your joy. No, what that spirit is doing is taking your life and you don't realize it because you don't know the difference. But the Holy Spirit wants you to know the difference because he has come to help you live a free life, not a tied up life. And I know people are going to walk out and join them. <laughs> Doesn't make a difference to me. I'm here to tell you whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I don't care how many people will walk out of church when these things are being taught. They did not go to Calvary. The Bible says you've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Everything that that antichrist spirit called the world system has for you is a curse. And Jesus came to break the curse that you and I couldn't break. He came to die on the cross for you and I. He was suspended before heaven and earth to show you how much he loved you, to show you how valuable you were. I'm here to tell you it's important that you and I understand these things. But oftentimes, you know, we don't even realize that we are. There's an old song, you know, that used to go, you know, people are like, what they try to do is this. They try to come to church. I go to church. But then you go out into the world and you live just like the world. You think like the world. You talk like the world. You watch media stuff just like the world. And you think it's not tormenting you. And you think, I don't know why I'm so agitated. I don't know why I have rebellion against my parents. I don't know why there's no honor in my life. I don't know why I have no respect. I will show you biblically, not because I'm saying it. The creator who created you is showing you how you are to live your life. How you can live free if you want it. Many people love their sin. They love their demons. They love those seducing spirits because they're so driven by the flesh. But they show up to church on a Sunday. Oh, yeah. They call them carnal Christians. Notorious. Yeah, they go right back to their pornography. 
They go right back to their abuse with their spouse. They disrespect with their mouth. There's no love coming from the father or the mother to their children or from the children to the father and the mother. And they're tormented, tortured in their soul because they will not unpack the soul baggage. They love it too much. You know what's keeping it there? The spirit of pride. Oh my God. You are not strong enough to break the spirit of pride. You will never be strong enough without the blood. You'll never have the power without the cross. You'll never have the strength without the Holy Spirit. It takes the grace of God and a humble spirit. Dr. Cho, who changed South Korea, said until a Christian understands what it means to live broken and surrendered, they will never see the power of God. Very rarely does he ever talk about this. I may get to that. But here, let me tell you why you're wrestling. It's not because you're not saved. Because you haven't made the decision. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, yeah. Galatians chapter 5. Here's my instruction, Paul says, but it's the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit and let the Holy Spirit bring order to your life. When you will not acknowledge the Holy Spirit, nor lean on Him, nor listen to the promptings. Well, I didn't hear a voice. You don't have to hear voices. The Holy Spirit will remind you of what the word you read. It will remind you that fornication is not God's will. Your flesh, is, your flesh is crying, craving. You know why? Because you're not rebuking it. You're just tolerating it. You kind of like it. I mean, there's a lot to like in the sense of your flesh being your flesh. But you better read the road sign. I knew you were narrow-minded. I knew you were narrow-minded. You preachers are all narrow-minded. No, you're the narrow-minded one. God gives you words, not as law and dominion and control, but guardrails. I'm glad that my father, years ago, had guardrails when he was driving down Mexico, and he was trying to make it in three days, and he had all of us, me, my sister, my mom, and he fell asleep at the wheel, and he hit the guardrail. Thank God, because a little further than that guardrail was a cliff. Guardrails are are guide rails. They keep you from going over. The word keeps you from going. You can violate it if you want. Mm. This is a fun service. <laughs> because you really need to hear what I'm about to share. I'm trying to get there. I'm almost there. I'm one verse away. Let the Holy Spirit bring order to your life. You know why marriages, Christian ones, get divorced? No Holy Spirit. I didn't say they weren't born again. No surrender. Too much pride. Call it Mexican. Call it Polynesian. Whatever you want to justify. You're just justifying your pride. Don't justify your pride. Destroy it. In the name of Jesus. Pride has killed many of families, many of marriages. They should have never died. Let the Holy Spirit bring order to your life. If you do, you will never give into your selfish and sinful cravings. That simply means the temptations. They're going to come, brothers and sisters. They're going to come. But if you haven't made up your mind that you're going to resist it, you won't. The thought comes, just a little bit more pornography. Yeah, I know I got a girlfriend, but hey, I got a side hustle. Oh, I know I got a marriage, but hey. Hey is for horses. <laughs> for everything the flesh desires goes against the Holy Spirit, and everything the Holy Spirit desires goes against the flesh. 
there is a constant battle raging between them that prevents you from doing the good that you want to do. The good as a father, the good as a mother, the good as a husband, the good as a wife, the good as a parent, the good as, you know, a, a child to his parents, the good as a person. You cannot live supernaturally, never will be able to live. You know, you might have your career, I got my career path, I don't need church. You're never going to get as far as you can go with the Holy Spirit. You never are. You're just never going to get there. For you to even think that way, even though you're speaking of no one, but you're speaking, I can hear you. I, I can hear you. God knows exactly who he's speaking to. You think you made your life. You haven't made anything. Your creator made it. He gifted it to you. And now you're making an idol out of it. Why? Because there's no humility. Why is there no humility? Because pride is dominating. I paid the price. I paid the money. Uh-huh. And he paid the price to give you a brain. And look how you're using it. Wow. Okay. So you're not going to believe that. Okay. So let me, let, me, let me help you. So there was a man by the name of Lot. Say Lot. Lot. Abraham's nephew. And he made a choice, like so many of us do, make a choice. And God rescued him. I want you to read, I want you to read this. And he made a decision because he was prideful. He decided to go to a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. It's like Christians who decide, you know, I'm going to go clubbing tonight. You know, there's a preacher that, if I use his name, every one of you would know him. You'd know the church. And I remember one time he came here and he was like, he was fascinating. He was contemporary. He was hip. He had tattoos. He had, he had muscles on muscles. He was in, a little bit on the intimidating side. He's in the United States, very well spoken, very uh, charismatic, very energetic. Something kind of just didn't, didn't fit. But, you know, I, I, for a moment there, I got swayed and I, and I brought him here because, I don't know, I did it. And, uh, and, and, and you know, he'd finish and, and everybody was more in, 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 in awe of him. And, uh, and I'd have to ask him to button up his buttons because he wanted to show his muscles. So I don't need to see that. A little bit on the intimidating side. And every time he'd come, there's a group of people that would always come with him. Only after the service. He used to go to his church in another part of the United States. Then he'd tell me, yeah, I know you probably want to go out and have a little dinner with him, but you know what? I, I, I go to clubs. And, and, and that's where I do my evangelism. And you probably wouldn't want, he, I, definitely he was pushing me away. And I said, I'm good with that. I don't go to no club. That person, just a few years later, had one of the greatest falls the United States has ever seen. So young, he destroyed his family. He had everything. He had prestige. He had fame. He had money. There's not a place he couldn't go in the world. There's not a place he did not go. But his pride... Brought him down. So this is what Peter says about this lot. And Lot made this decision and he went into Sodom and Gomorrah. And slowly but surely, some of you don't remember this song. It's called Slipping into Darkness. You don't remember it? Let's see, do we have the sound? Can you feel it? Oh, y'all don't even know. Okay, stop it. They don't, they're not feeling it. They're not, you're not feeling anything. That was in my BC days. It was really BC. That was before Christ, if you don't know what BC stands for. <laughs> now you know a little bit of the music I used to listen to and why I was so messed up. So it says, and God condemned and ruined the extinction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, reducing them to ashes. 
and thus sent them forth as an example to those who would be ungodly. Verse seven, and he rescued righteous Lot, greatly worn out and distressed by the wanton ways of the ungodly and lawless. This is gonna show you something. By the wanton ways of the Christless people, of people who were anti-Christ, not even factoring God. They just said, I'm not religious, I'm not that. And then they have all their habits and you so want them into your life, you don't even realize they're a setup to bring you down. The word wanton means coarse, crude, dirty, filthy, foul. Can I go on? I will. It says nasty. It means um, pornographic. It means profane, raunchy. And so we open up Instagram and we watch movies at night and we do these little things because, hey, it's not gonna hurt me. If you didn't have the Bible, if I didn't have the Bible to show you, you wouldn't even believe what I'm about to share with you. You don't even realize why you're worn out. This is one of the ways that the enemy deceives. He knows he doesn't have power over you, but he will deceive and says, hey, it's just a movie. It's just music. Some of you listen to some of the raunchiest stuff. And I don't even, I mean, you're sexual. Sexy red, whatever. And the fact that you laugh, you know who she is. You need to come up and... <laughs> Probably you do. <laughs> Nasty, obscene, you know, vulgar and X-rated. And you think no one's around. I'm mature. I'm a university student. I'm a young adult. I'm married and you don't know why your marriage is going south, and you don't know why your relationships are going south, and you don't know why you're always bitter, you don't know why you're not happy. You don't see it because it's seduction. You're being seduced. No, no, I'm not. I'm being relevant. I'm being cool. I'm being hip. Listen, you can be cool and hip without being captured and poisoned. How dare you say that? How dare I not? You don't need, people don't understand, Christians don't understand why they're being worn out, why they become weary. Well, I'm strong in the Lord. I'm born again. I, I go to church on Sunday. I go to a life group. I, go, I do this and I do that. I do this and I do that. And you're still as weak as a baboon with no eyes and you don't even know where you're going. You're distressed. You know you can break out of distress. Some of you don't know why you're depressed, why you're oppressed. You're not a bad person. I didn't say you weren't saved. I said your soul is being tormented. I'll show you. Verse 8. For that just man living there among them. Some of you live there. You live in social media. You live. You've got to see. You've got to see what everybody's putting up. You've got to see that latest. You've got to see that series. You've got to hear him. You've got to see him. And you put up with, you put up with, you put up with. And you don't think it's affecting you. Remember, you didn't create you. He created you. And now he's showing you what affects your soul. Watch. It's right here. Lot was living there in the midst of the world, in the midst of their influences, in the midst of their sexual perversion. In the midst, he was exposing himself. He made the choice to go there. But he also made the choice not to come out. But God did send a rescue to him. Look what it says here, as you probably already read it behind me. For that just man living there among them tortured his righteous soul every day with what he saw and what he heard. The eye gates to your soul, sorry, the eye gates are an access point to your soul, your ear gates. If you don't guard your heart, how do you guard your heart? By what you see and what you hear. We're just being religious. Am I? Am I? I'm not being religious. Big fact, because every one of you are going to make decisions to live however you want to live once you live. God can't even control you. He's asking you, let the Holy Spirit order your life. You know the difference between right and wrong, good and bad, evil and, um, you know, pure. It says, by their lawful wicked ways, he wasn't doing it, but he was exposing himself to it. But what he didn't realize, and what 
the Holy Spirit reveals to us is that exposing yourself to that affects your soul. So your soul gets, has all this baggage and you don't even know why you can't love your spouse, why you can't love your children. For a father to not be able to say, I love you to my children is no father. He's just a figure. Or a mother or a child. That has broken more hearts, damaged more souls. Soul baggage is nothing but antichrist influences, voices, things you see, things you hear. Paul told Timothy, turn away from irreverent babble, from godless chatter, from vain and empty phrases, from subtleties, contradictions that call themselves spiritual illumination, such as the gossip, the backbiting, the rebel talk, the negative speech, justified in so many ways. You know, the discord, the hurt, the pain. You think it's not affecting you. It's not just affecting you, it's tormenting you. Because it's not the way the Holy Spirit. When does the Holy Spirit ever ask you, direct you, to have unforgiveness, to carry offenses, to carry a grudge, to be in strife, to be angry. I realize people are imperfect around us, but the world around you is not how you govern your life. You govern your life by the Spirit inside you, the Holy Spirit. So, last statement. You said that before, Pastor Art. Some of you, us, as Dr. Cho said, so impacted me. When you study the life of a man who's now gone, who's changed the nation and changed the world, which I can't even begin to tell you. He talks about a brokenness and the surrender but it's not a brokenness where God crushes you and takes away your dignity or security. It's not like you go around like, you know, you're worthless and you have no value. No, no, no. That's not the kind of brokenness I'm talking about. The Bible says a broken and contrite heart will God lift up. So the picture is this one. The only thing that will keep you from repentance is your pride that you think you don't have. That's why Peter got offended at Jesus. What? Sorry. Yeah, El Pedro. The one who said, you know, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And then Jesus says, just later, later, he says, I must go to the cross. And then all of a sudden, Jesus, uh, Peter rebukes him and says, no, you shall not go to the cross. Jesus turns around and says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. And Peter sits there like, hey, I'm the one who had the revelation. You're calling me say, what, 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 where's Satan? I don't know. Hmm. The same person, Peter, dealt with pride all of his life. He's the one who said, I'll never forsake you. Jesus said to him, before the, what is it? He will deny me three times before the cock crows. And Jesus looked right into his eyes on the last time that he denied him. He denied Jesus. He cussed. He used blasphemies. Where you see where he dealt with his pride the most. So Jesus walks up to Peter. And he says, Peter, how would your fishing go today? Luke chapter 5. Oh, no, we didn't catch anything. And Jesus says to him, he says, cast your nets, say nets, yes. plural, over the side. Then Peter goes, in his pride, he says, you know, you know, you might be doing that religious kind of stuff and have a few people following you, but I 
don't know if I'm too into that, you know, whatever. But I know fishing. I know more than you know. I was out there. I sweated. I paid the price for these nets. I was out there laboring and toiling. You weren't out there with me, Jesus. Now you're going to tell me how to fish. I've been doing this all my life, okay? I've gone out there. There are no fishes. And Jesus says, throw your nets over the side. And his pride was so, I mean, he was standing looking at Jesus. Like so many people, they look at Jesus, but they just don't follow him. Yeah, you got your perspective, but this is my world. You don't understand my world. You don't understand fishing. You understand that stuff, whatever it is, but you know, but not fishing. And finally, he gives in a little bit. And the Bible says he took one net and he threw it over the side. Go back and read it, Luke chapter five. He throws one net. Jesus said, throw all the nets. He threw one net. And with that one net, wherever it was, from there, he caught a boatload of fish. At that moment, not his natural eyes, his heart was opened and he realized that had to be supernatural. This is his brokenness. He bows down. He says, get away from me. I am a sinner, not worthy to be in your presence. Most people can't do that. Their pride is too thick. Jesus said, never, he knew what was in his heart. Pride, offense, arrogance, self-perspective, baggage, baggage. He was angry, he was upset, Peter was. Jesus never condemned him, never shamed him, never accused him. And when he bowed his knee in brokenness, Jesus said, come on, follow me. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. He didn't put him down. He didn't say, I told you so. No, he doesn't. And he won't do it to you. He just takes you from where you are with his unconditional love and mercy and moves you forward. But at that moment, when he bowed his knees, he realized he is the creator. I am the created. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. Cho said, until you have brokenness, the Holy Spirit could be talking to you right now about how you're treating your spouse, your loved ones, the people God gave you. Put them in your life. That wife, that husband, those children. And the Holy Spirit's been for years telling you, why don't you love them? Why don't you hug them? Why are you so angry? Why are you so bitter? And the only reason you are, the only reason you are, pride. You will not bend your knee to Jesus. Brokenness, the only other word for that is humility. The Bible says clothe yourself in humility. Because sometimes, even as a Christian, as a pastor, as a leader, as a father, success is in many ways in this room. The Holy Spirit will speak to you. Get rid of that. Things that are not even sinful in one sense, but are hindering you. Veils. Blindness. Issues. Soul baggage. He says, it's time to unpack that bag. And then when you humble yourself, Cho said, Dr. Cho said, it's when you surrender yourself. You surrender because, like I said of my pastor, my pastor Cesar Castellanos, he would never ask me to do anything that would hurt my life. God would never ask you to do anything that brings hurt. It always brings freedom. That's why repentance is the open door to a fresh new way of living. Do you receive something today? All right. Let's all stand to our feet, if we would, please. 
soul baggage. You know, I was praying and praying this morning. That's what I heard. Got that at 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, you were snoring. I can hear you all the way from me. No, you were not snoring. I only say that because this I do know, family. God knows exactly who is here. God knows exactly what's going on in your heart. And God is speaking to all of us. We're going to order our lives. We're going to renounce some things here this morning. It's going to open the door. It's not... The Bible says that God resists the proud. I've been proud in so many categories of my life. <clears throat> As a Christian, areas of pride. I, I come from championship prideful people. We have trophies in the history of my life. The Gobarubias, that's my lineage. The Sepulvedas, my lineage. Super deep pride, dark, 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 dark. <laughs> you know, always justifying, never living life. And God will continue by the Holy Spirit. He'll order your life. He'll remind you in the simplest of ways. I'm not talking about doctrine, theology, but the Bible says he resists the proud, but those who will humble themselves, he adds more grace. For the businessmen and women in this room, for the young entrepreneurs that have so much to live for, so much to do for the kingdom of God and for humanity in so many ways, your success is in more grace, not more of you. The humble heart receives more grace. University students, high school students, degreed individuals, accomplished we all applaud you. You are going to bring so much good to humanity if the Lord tarries. But remember, no matter what it is that you have, he put it in your hands. Don't make an idol of it. Don't make a God of it. Serve him. And with what he's given you, you'll serve. You'll influence. You'll impact. But the moment you start lifting yourself up, even as a father, where your children cannot speak to you, they're afraid of you, they're terrified of your anger fits, your fits of depression, your fits of oppression, because you can't control yourself, yet you come to church. And, and I'm not saying that, I don't know, maybe you're here, maybe not, I don't know who it is. You know, we don't know. You just have to say, God, I need you to order my life. Some of us, we say God's in control, but he controls nothing. And it takes a surrender. Can you trust him? When I was in South Africa, he said, listen, yield, trust, and obey. Not very deep, but very powerful. Listen. Listen as you're reading the word. Holy Spirit's talking to you. Heal. Really, Lord? Is that me? That's why you need to have personal devotional time. Personal. He wants to just talk to you. But he never talks to me. No, he always talks to you. Trust him. And obey. Oh, I can't tell you how many times God used my children to help this father, to help this pastor. I remember one of the times, and it's been all of them really, all my girls have wisdom. But they always had it at the time that I didn't want to hear it. You know, like when they said, Daddy, you need to go up and say I'm sorry to Mommy. I said, why? Pride. Why? Well, the way you spoke. What did I say? Like that. They just look at me and roll their eyes. Conviction. It's not easy sometimes, is it? And I'm not saying that's your story. 
it's not that I didn't know theologically, doctrinally, that you're supposed to be nice and kind, compassionate, loving, this and the other. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will use people to speak. You ever asked yourself the question why you can't love people? Okay, you can't be kind. No one has to live under oppression. No one has to live tortured. No one has to live depressed. No one has to live, you know, frustrated. It's not the Holy Spirit. He'll lead you right out of that. He will order your life if we will but surrender our lives. Two kinds of people I'm going to pray for and then we're going to close. The first are people that might be here this morning and you're not sure that you're born again. So we're all going to pray this prayer together. Together, everyone. And if you've never prayed this prayer Pray it genuinely. We're all going to pray with you. And we're going to ask Christ to change our hearts. And if you're sincere, he will do that. So I just ask you to just bow your, bow your heads and close your eyes. And say these words after me. Everyone, everyone in this room. Say, Heavenly Father, I come before you in the name of Jesus. And I want to thank you that you came to this world with unconditional love. The Bible clearly says that you so loved the world that was not a planet, it was us people, humanity. You so loved the world that you sent your only begotten Son that whoever would receive Him would receive eternal life. Father, you did not send your son into the world to condemn the world, but the world might be saved. Lord, I'm not sure whether I'm saved, but right now I want to acknowledge that you've come with unconditional love, not just for others, but for me. I need my heart changed. I need to be saved. You make a promise that you will take the stony heart out and give me a new heart. That only you can change my life. You went to the cross of Calvary. You took upon yourself the curse of the world and paid for my sins and all the sins of humanity. You died on that cross. You went to hell to defeat the adversary. And victorious, you rose on the third day, giving me the right, the choice, to ask you to be my Savior, to forgive me, to give me new life, that I might be born again. Jesus, you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. You poured out your blood. And today, I ask you, be my Savior. Forgive me of all my sins, all my transgressions. Send now into my heart the Holy Spirit. I believe in the name of Jesus, I believe in the Son of God. I believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world and of my life right now. In this moment, I ask for your saving power, your grace and mercy, your unconditional forgiveness to set me free whom the Son sets free, and only you can set me free from an antichrist spirit, from a world of darkness, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And now I declare, I'm a Christian, born again, a new creation in Christ Jesus, old things, all sins, transgressions, faults and failures of my past are now under the blood. New life in Christ Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit now is in me. 
I am free. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. <clears throat> Come on, give him a great big hand clap. If you prayed that prayer, that's powerful. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Now I'm going to pray for the church. Some of you walked in here and you are saved. And I don't, question, I don't even question that. But you have soul baggage. I'm telling you, there's a miracle at hand. Matthew 13 says this. It says, seeing they will not see, hearing they will not hear, perceiving with their hearts, they will not perceive, therefore their hearts will not be healed. But when we repent, in other words, when we renounce, resist, sometimes we have things, opinions, mindsets. I don't think you know everything right now. I don't think you know everything that's going on in your life right now. I don't, I don't presume that. But I want you to be open to what God's word will share with you. How he will disciple you, maybe through your life group leader, maybe through a pastor. Um, <clears throat> maybe just him speaking to you. And the decision we're going to make is not a decision that's unbiblical, not not formed by a group of people here in Honolulu, Hawaii, but by the Word of God, and which is ordering your life by the Holy Spirit. If you will do that, everything starting in the next moments will be radically different. It doesn't take you long to be revived, but it takes authenticity. It takes brokenness. Because some of you are dealing with your pride. I know what pride looks like. I know what pride feels like. It's so justifying. It does not, listen to me. It thinks it's gonna get embarrassed. It thinks it's gonna be shamed. You're not gonna do that, are you? You're not, you're not gonna do that, are you? That's what it sounds like. Pride has a sound. It will not humble itself. It will justify, no, no, you're a pastor. No, no, no. Too many people know you. No, no, no. I remember Pastor Cesar was on this stage one of the first times he came and he was talking about the bitterness that some of you, he was talking generally. He was talking right to me and the hurts and pains you have of your earthly father. And my father put a lot of trash in our lives, just a lot of abuse. And I, but it'd been years. And I had already made the decision. I am never going to be like my father. I'm never going to be like my dad. I, I refuse to be that. And I had all the pride he ever had. And when pastor says, I said, some of you have issues with your father or your parents. He did say father. And the moment he said that, something hit me like a cold wave. Like I was afraid. And the first thing that came to my head, you can't go up. I was right there where David Lee says, right there. Pastor says that on the lower stage was right here. He never looked at me, but the Holy Ghost was like shouting at me. He said, some of you have to come up here and you have to repent of your pride. You have to be willing to forgive your father. And the first thing, and I don't even know where the thought came from. You can't go up there. You're the senior pastor. You can't go up there. People are going to see you. You're a titled person. You're successful. I was broken. And I couldn't see it. It was the hardest thing for me to bend my knee. It was the hardest thing for me to bend my knee. And I knew because I went into cold sweats. I mean, I literally went into cold sweats. Now, this is, this is years ago. But still, I remember that was the first time. And God began to show me in time how it was hindering my life and my walk with my family. My marriage needed to be restored. I was a Christian and my wife needed to be loved and I couldn't love her. My children needed to be loved, I couldn't love them. I was so lost in, in, in a spiritual world of success and competition and envy and jealousy, just all kinds of trash that was going on. Oh, so much stuff was going on. 
we were young in, in, in the Lord, but that's all that stuff was going on. He said, oh, you're admitting all of that? Yeah, because I'm free. I don't know about you, but I'm free. I really am. No, I'm serious. But, but um, I share that with you because the pride is very strong. And uh, I've known about pride, but I didn't know what it sounded like. I didn't know what it felt like. But it, it, it kind of paralyzes you. It keeps you from moving forward. Mm. Now, if there's nothing going on, there's nothing going on. But I mean, if, for me, it was. And I remember I came up to the altar. It was like the longest walk. It felt like the, you know, the Green Mile, that movie. You know, and I was walking the Green Mile and I was going to my execution. Exactly right. I was going to execute pride. That's what it, but it, from there to the first steps, you don't know this if you've been around. There's a stage under here that we covered up a long time ago. It's beautiful. I don't know why we did. Anyways, the point is, and uh, it was like the longest mile for me to get here, but I got here and I remember I bent my knee and, uh, you know, not, wasn't per se emotional, but I bent my knee and I recognized. And I just simply say that because uh, your story is not my story. And God could work wherever you're at. And I'm not saying everyone in this room has pride. But it's rich of the imagination. But many years ago, that's where I began to learn how to allow the Holy Spirit just to lead and guide me. God, he never shamed me. He never condemned me. God never did. He just simply said, son, are you ready to unpack that? Many times before that, I didn't want it to be unpacked. You know why? I was afraid of you. I was afraid of what you would think of me. Because I was told, I don't know what I was told. I don't know who told me. I think it was the devil, but he told me. Somehow he communicated really good to me. You know, you can't do that. But I just want to share it with you. If you're here today, my friends, and there's some baggage that you have and hurts, it's important that you say, God, we're going to renounce it. We're going to renounce it. I'm going to pray for you. It's going to be renounced. You're going to renounce it. I can't. I will pray with you. You're going to follow me, and we're going to renounce some things. But I don't know if you want to renounce it. There were times in my life that I wasn't ready. Maybe some of you aren't ready to give up that fornication. I'm not saying that as condemning. I don't even know who you are. Maybe you're not ready to give up your strife. I don't know why you wouldn't be. I don't know why you're not willing to give up your, you know, that... That unforgiveness. I don't care whether dad's next to you, mom's next to you, brother's next to you, Christian so and so is next to you. Give up the jealousy. Give up the anger. Give up. Give it all up. That's the baggage. It's 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 not you. It's the, you and I cannot do it. it. Takes the Holy Spirit, and we're going to ask Him. But if you're ready, you say, Pastor, there is something in my life. It might not be anything that you spoke about, not a thing you spoke about, but it is something else. It's been taunting me. The frustration, the intimidation, the insecurity, always feeling shame. In Hawaii, one of the first things I recognized when I got here from California, I'm a golly boy. I, I don't claim it now. Wrong governor over there. But anyways, um, but the point is this. I recognize, everyone's always talking about shame. I shame, I shame, I shame. That is uh, an attitude that has to be broken, not justified. Oh, you know me, I'm just shame, I'm shame. No. You're in Christ, you're in Christ, you're in Christ. But if you have any insecurity, you might not know all the things. I didn't know everything. I couldn't handle everything. If God would have told me everything, in the course of my life, it would have been overwhelming. But what he does is he keeps you going from grace to grace and glory to glory. Because what we're going to ask is for more of his grace. Christian, you're not a work of yourself. You're a work of his grace. Paul said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Depend on his grace. It's an ability beyond your ability. It's an ability to be free, not because of you, because of him. It's a brokenness. God, I need you so much. I need you. I don't know how to be kind. I'm tired of carrying these hurts and pains. Whatever it is. 
It's time to break that and renounce it. And we're going to do that. So if that's you, you say, Pastor Art, I do have something. I want to bring it to this altar. Bring it to this altar, if you would, please. Come here. And I'm going to have some leaders that are going to be ready to pray for you. And... Um, <clears throat> Anyways, the leader's going to get in front of you. <clears throat> if, if they're not here, that's fine. Don't worry about it. The Holy Spirit's going to do a lot more work in a few moments. We are going to ask the Holy Spirit. He is going to do such a powerful work. I don't know who you are. But maybe for the first time, you're going to ask God to order your life. Some things have been out of order. You're not bad in character. You're not not born again. Some of you know some things that have gone on. If there's a person in front of you, they will pray with you. But you're going to renounce in just a second. So let me open up in prayer, then I will lead you. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, you know us all so, so well. You know us deeply. You know us passionately. Father, you know before I arrived, before they arrived, who is going to be here how you were going to orchestrate, how you were going to speak to their hearts. But the myriad of people that are here, Lord, you've spoken to everyone personally. Oftentimes, Lord, we were challenged by what we heard. But it's why you've sent your Holy Spirit, not to condemn, but to convict, to speak to us. That was your prompting, Lord. God. Some of us have carried some bitter pain and hurts in our lives. Some of us have carried some things that we've opened the doors to. Like Lot, made some choices and it's not paid off, but it's cost us greatly. Some of us are beginning to understand what we've opened our ears to or our eyes to and why sometimes we feel tormented and sad. Lord, why oppression and depression has come in and loneliness in a sense of lack of connection. Why some of us need right now to be revived in every category of our life. Lord, some of us admittedly so in the quietness of our own chambers, our own heart. We know where we stand as a father as a mother, as a brother, as a sister, as a Christian, Father, as a friend, as an individual, as a young man, as a young woman, as a man, as a woman, Father God, we know the idols. You've pointed these things out to us today, and we're willing to bring them to this altar, not because we knew what we were doing in the time that we did it, but because what you're bringing illumination by your Holy Spirit to us right now. Lord, I sense in my heart there are many people here, good people that are going to make such a powerful difference in this world. But I pray, Lord, that you would take off blindness, that you'd open their eyes to see that it's your grace that makes them powerful. It's the work of the cross. It's the power of your blood. It's the work of the Holy Spirit that's here. Father, there's excitement there's thrill, there's power in this room to make such a difference. But Father, may each and every one of us, including myself, no matter who we are, present in this room or online right now, that we would have room to bend our knee to you and to say, God, we come before you and we open our hearts and we open every chamber in our heart and we ask you to have a free look. And as you did for Levi, do for us 
Lord, there are things in our lives that we know that we've battled with, issues that we've contended with, that we have not been able to fix in our own strength with the best of information and the best of education and the best of the applause of people around us. We know deep down inside, Lord, that we have not been able to fix that which seems to be broken consistently. And we come this morning to that place that you invited us to, the place of your throne. We come to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace in the time of our need. And Father, if ever there is a war going on, it is a cultural war. It is an antichrist spirit trying to infiltrate, Father God, and influence, Father God, the culture of your kingdom. And today I pray that, Lord, today you would breathe upon every person. As Job once said, the Spirit of the Lord has made me and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Lord, I'm asking as we pray in the next couple of moments, Lord God, that you would bring life and strength, that you would revive your people. Lord God, that you would do what no man can do, not the person in front of them, not the person behind them, not a family member, not a great friend, not a great counselor, Lord God, but only you. In these moments, Lord, we pray that you would focus our eyes and that we'd fix our eyes, Lord God, on you and we need your help. Lord, we approach this time with a humble heart. Father, some of us have a difficulty with humility and so we bring up that pride. We bring up that pride that has scorned us and hurt us. The labels that we have carried, Father God, today, in the name of Jesus, we ask. We know, Lord God, that we ask in the name of Jesus, you hear us. Lord, there's a confidence in this room that you are ready to move upon our hearts by your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to make yourself so real in the name of Jesus, so real in the life of every individual, no matter where they come from, no matter what they've been through, no matter what's been imposed upon them, what's been abused in their lives. Father God, what things seem so impossible today, Lord God, as a day where we're going to listen to you, Lord God, we're going to yield to you. That's why we come to this altar. We're going to trust you. Father, we're going to believe in everything that you said, that you love us unconditionally. Say these words after me. Heavenly Father, everyone in this room, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you and ask you, Father, to help me by the power of your Holy Spirit to order my life, to unpack the toxic soul damage that's been done in my heart, in my emotions, in my thinking, every opinion that I have that's a secret or that's public. Father, today, I want to end the struggle. I come before you and I surrender everything you bring to my attention. I ask you in the name of Jesus, I ask you to pour out your mercy. I choose as best I know how in this moment right now to give up any pride, any shame, any insecurity that I believed could not be uh, given up. But I know today I can. For in the name of Jesus, the name that's above every name, the name by which every knee shall bow, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I will not tolerate any antichrist attitude, no matter what it is, no matter how deep it's been, how many years it's lingered, no matter how popular in this world culture today, I choose your word. I choose the Holy Spirit. I choose the name of Jesus. Jesus, I make a decision to never compromise ever again how I will follow you. I choose this day to be your disciple. I'm asking you to teach me through your word, 
by your Holy Spirit. I humble myself. I know, Lord God, I've resisted you. I know, Lord God, I've been offended by some of your truth. I've been challenged with the opinions of a world, the opinions of voices, people that call themselves friends. They've challenged me. And I've been challenged when your truth came into my heart. I've been tormented. I've been frustrated. I've been worn down. I've been distressed. I've lived in fear. I've lived in secure. I've lived in weakness. I've sensed my strength leaving me. But not today. Today I put a stop by the blood of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, against that python spirit that is trying to suffocate me and take the breath of God out of my life. I rebuke every demon power, every antichrist spirit, every attitude, no matter how it came to me, whether through education or experience, or circumstance, or temptation, no matter what it was, how it was, who it was, I do not, I do not fight against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood are not my problem. Flesh and blood is not my enemy. My parents, my father, my mother, my siblings are not my problem. I fight against every lying spirit, seducing spirit with doctrines of demons. That python spirit, I rebuke, renounce, resist, reject, uproot in the name of Jesus. Every foul attitude, lying spirit, deceiving spirit that has tried to influence, poison my soul, taint my soul, damage my soul. It called itself spiritual, but spiritual it was not. It was not godly. I rebuke every voice of rebellion. I rebuke every voice of offense. I rebuke in the name of Jesus the spirit of unforgiveness. I rebuke the spirit of profanity, pornography, lying, deceit, deception, seduction. I come against the lust of the spirit, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, pride arrogance, self-centeredness. I renounce you. I take authority in the name of Jesus. I charge my spirit by the Holy Spirit to follow your word, the pattern of your word. Jesus, you said you have come to set me free. Your word is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So right now, I take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, spoken out of my mouth, and I sever every deceit, rebellion, every spirit of gossip and discord, every offense, jealousy, envy, competitiveness. Father, today, in the name of Jesus, I choose to renounce, reject pride. I humble myself. I humble my heart. I need you. I need your mercy. I need your grace. I need your power. It's not my power. Father, if I've lifted up people, things, images in any way, making them idols 
honoring them, honoring it above and beyond your word. Well, today, in the name of Jesus, I ask for your forgiveness. I renounce that spirit. I close the door on the devil. I renounce it. I don't want it part of my life. It will never be part of my life. If I've not guarded my heart, if I've not protected what you deposit on the inside of me, if I've lost my joy, if I've lost my happiness, if I've lost my spiritual strength because of choices I have made, today I renounce every choice I have made. Choices have consequences, but so does repentance. I repent. I repent. I ask you, only you, with your power, the power of your blood, the power of the name of Jesus, and the power of my confession, do I renounce every false decision I have ever made that's hindered my life, that's hindered my family, that's hindered relationships, people that I've hurt, people that I've influenced in a wrong way today, no matter who it is, father, mother, brother, sister, another person, another Christian, a friend, if I've kept secrets, secret hurts, secret pains, secret losses, secret challenges, secret bitterness, I uproot it right now in the name of Jesus no matter if it was a relationship from a long time ago I'm tired of carrying the fear the torment the distress of that situation no matter what I've done no matter how I did it no matter how sinful it was I renounce it only you by the power of your blood can cleanse my heart only you can save my soul you saved lot you can save me you can rescue my soul i ask you now now oh god now oh god revive me revive my life revive everything that you've given me my relationship with you i want it fresh I need it pure. I come before you with a broken and contrite heart, a surrendered heart. I choose you, Jesus. I choose you, Jesus. I renounce the things of the Antichrist spirit. Help me, Holy Spirit. Breathe on me. Breathe on me. Breathe on me. Lift your hands up. Lift your hands up. Lift your hands up. Ask him to breathe on you. 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 I want this song to be your prayer. I need this song to be your prayer. I need this song to be your prayer. I just got to say it and say it and say it. Oh, Holy Spirit, come now. You've already come. You already live inside of us, oh God. mothers, parents, lift your hands up all over this room. Worship Him. Fall heavy on this place. Let's worship.
Father, by your Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, you have moved upon hearts, hearts at this altar, hearts that are online, hearts that are in this audience. And Father God, what you have begun, 
begins instantly. The freedom, the newness, the freshness, the purity begins instantly. Not in another minute, another hour, another day, now. And for that, we simply say thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for the fathers. Thank you for the mothers, the parents, the children. Thank you. Thank you for a generation, God. God, they seem so ordinary. What you will do, Father, in a short amount of time is nothing short of revolutionary. We simply say thank you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving this generation a spiritual backbone. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's put our hands together for him, if you would, please. Amen. I want you to hug at least uh, five people and say, I can see God is going to work in you. God bless each and every one of you. Shalom to all of you. Thank you for coming. Thank you, all of you that are online. We love you. We appreciate you. God bless.